Sadly, the sailing season was coming to a close. The factory considers the two large chart plotters in the cockpit to be obscene, but we find them very handy in navigating new shallows. I felt guilty running the motor, but I needed to accumulate a few more engine hours to qualify for the first oil change. Gail is adjusting the level of zoom on the chart plotter to better orient herself for an upcoming series of turns. The port screen is set up to her liking and the starboard screen is for me. Across the two screens we like to see the chart very zoomed in and also a wider view. Finally, the forward looking sonar page is very reassuring. When in coastal waters I do enjoy gawking at the amazing homes. This one wins today's trophy. Well, back to our favorite sport, docking. I prefer coming in stern first. It offers a better view and finer control. Many other boaters disagree with me. The tough part for me is to figure out when to turn the boat into the slip. With a car, a later turn is best. With a boat, I tend to turn early. I aim at the neighboring boat's midships. The marina staff in France have been brilliant. I'm always anxious to know the location of our slip as we rarely repeat marinas. Gail has a docking perch outside the lifelines with the backstay as a handhold. I will miss her when I try solo docking. The orange inflatable boat in the distance is the marina docking boss. His position is an indication of our slip's location. For today's arrival, we have a small crowd of fellow boaters watching our efforts. You will notice the neighboring boat getting the whole family out to critique the arrival. No pressure? I do a short touch of the thruster to spin the bow, but this also moves the stern. The camera I'm using to film this has a fisheye lens, which distorts the distances and makes the boat look curved. Next year, I will film with a more realistic camera. From my low level of competence, I offer the following observation. If you are lucky enough to get the first third of the boat lined up into the slip, you are pretty much done. The most common mistake to make at this point is to stop the boat too early. Keep the speed on. A short application of the forward gear stops the boat in almost no distance. Yippee! We're tied up and it's time to relax. This French fort was built by the Spanish in 1850 to aid French Catholics in a war. The French war of religion was raging between the French Catholics and the French Protestants, better known as Huguenots. The Huguenots lost the war in some part due to this fort. When I hear the words East India Company, I think of the UK controlling India, wooden warships, and trade. The English, however, were not the only ones to have such an enterprise. In Lorient, the French started their own East India Company and went a step further than the English. They named the town Orient, or Lorient, if you have a French accent. This is a painting of Monsieur Colbert, one of the early bosses of the Compagnie des Indes Orientales. They were granted a 50-year monopoly in both the Pacific and Indian Oceans by the French government. No other French company could trade in this region, but the English and the Dutch were very active. Many a book are written about the causes of the French East India Company's failure. I have not read any of them. The French East India Company was eventually taken over by Louis XV, and the port became a naval base. They decided to name the naval base Port Louis. I'm sure the naming decision was decided by popular vote. Maybe the next boat will be one of these, Gail. Mm -hmm. The next section of the museum was on shipwrecks and life-saving. Naufrage is French for shipwreck. However, this word will not help you at your local French restaurant. Coastlines with strong tides require that their Coast Guard stations actually have a ramp to get far enough out into the sea when the tide is out. The rescue boat descends the ramp on wheels and then enters the surf. 
On the white floaty thing, it says in French that it's good for three people or five to six children. Are you kidding me? Museum time is now over, and tonight we head off for a great French restaurant on the ocean. One of the joys of having a French boat is that everything that I've encountered so far is metric. So I don't have to have two sets of tools, SAE and metric. All I got is metric on board. And right now we're taking out this for a box of steak knives. What tool is this? I think this tip might be a can over, I'm not sure. But this part is a shackle key. Too big. Evidence the shackle key did work, but I'm not sure a pair of pliers isn't easier. The soft shackles have a little controller device that lets you make them opening a bit bigger. Which I'm trying to demonstrate while filming, which is not that easy. And that's how all my sheets are attached, the spin, staysail. That's kind of nice. They also did another nice touch, which I like, which it's sewn onto the sheet this soft shackle so you can't lose it. This device, it's called an Ontal Tensioner and its job is it holds the Genoa halyard. And so you come to the mast and you move it from the locked position, it's in lock now, and you move it to the free position and this car can go up and down. And you attach this little line that I've already attached and you bring it down to a winch and by easing or cranking on the winch, you move the car up and down. And the result is the same thing as tightening or loosening a jib halyard. After it's all stowed, the benefit is you don't have another 20 feet of halyard sitting in the cockpit taking up space. The downside is a little bit of a, a rigmarole. Um, to put a bit of halyard tension on, you have to come to the mast. When I arrived at the boat for the first time, I found a ball bearing uh, on the deck and have never been able to figure out where it came from. So we're looking in the mast track to see if a ball bearing fell out of this. During the boat build, the factory failed to properly cock the handle for the hatch. No biggie. When the rain stopped, I was able to quickly fix it. Before getting medieval on the Velcro, you stick a flathead screwdriver in there in a long way. Anyone willing to offer me a lesson in how to remove battens? I'm seeming to struggle with this task. There we go. Inside your sail, there is a long batten pocket. This batten pocket comes to an area which widens, and the end of the batten at the leech is entering into this device. It sits inside the sail, inside the batten pocket. On the outside of the sail, right here, are retention items to keep the SBR in the sail. Okay, now that's all in there, and there's a batten in there. How do you keep the tension on your batten? Well, you do that vis-a-vis -vis this device. This goes into the SBR, like so. As you tighten it, you are ramming the batten harder and harder. Hard batten means more curvature in the sail. Looser batten means it might drop better. Kudos to the rigger who, at the end of all of the halyards, gives you this little loop so that when you're mousing the line, which is a fancy word for putting the halyard away for the winter and putting in a cheapo line, this is the halyard color for the staysail. And here's the sheet color for the staysail. Now you're not gonna ever get them confused because they're very different parts of the boat, but your brain immediately recognizes they should work in tandem. And we place them with messenger lines which are kind of disposable. This yellow line, which is the reef for the clue, first reef for the clue, has uh, left the boat and is now fully replaced by a little inexpensive messenger line for the winter. All the running rigging is now stripped and safely inside the boat for winter. During the next episode, Cyclops gets hauled out for the winter.